Good morning, everyone. I am Maria Lourdes P. Magtaas, joined by Ms. Samantha Nicole D. Barreto, and we are here to discuss about the natural causes of death. So here are the topics to be discussed, the introduction, common causes of natural death, negative autopsy, and laboratory tests. Before we start, allow me to recap our first lesson regarding the natural causes of death. So, as we all know, natural causes of death are those resulting from internal factors or diseases typically unrelated to external influences such as injury or violence. These causes are often related to underlying medical conditions or physiological processes within the body, such as diseases of the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, or various examples include heart disease, stroke, cancer, infectious diseases, and organ failure. Determining natural causes of death is crucial in both medical and forensic contexts for understanding disease pathology, guiding treatment, and investigating deaths where no foul play is suspected. In forensic medicine, identifying natural causes of death helps forensic pathologists to accurately determine the circumstances surrounding an individual's demise and rule out foul play or external factors. Now that we have recalled your knowledge, let us further dive into the different diseases that would lead to natural causes of death, starting with the cardiovascular system. So first, we have coronary atherosclerosis. This is characterized by the accumulation of plaque within the walls of coronary arteries. Plaque is composed of lipids, cholesterol, inflammatory cells, and fibrous tissues. Microscopically, the arterial wall may show fatty streaks, fibrous plaques, and calcified deposits. So the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis begins with endothelial damage, allowing lipids to infiltrate the arterial wall. Inflammatory cells such as macrophages accumulate within the plaque, leading to inflammation and further damage. Over time, the plaque may rupture, leading to thrombosis and acute obstruction of blood flow, resulting in myocardial infarction or heart attack, or sudden cardiac death. The gross findings of coronary atherosclerosis is that coronary arteries affected by atherosclerosis may reveal visible narrowing or obstruction of the vessel lumen due to the buildup of plaque. The arterial wall may appear thickened and irregular with areas of yellowish-white plaque deposition. Calcified deposits may also be present, giving the artery a hardened, calcified appearance. In advanced cases, the affected arteries may show signs of luminal stenosis or occlusion, compromising blood flow to the heart muscle. We now go on to the second um, cardiovascular disease, which is bridging or coronary artery bridging. So, the presence of a bridging segment can lead to the compression of the artery during systole, impairing blood flow and increasing the risk of myocardial ischema, especially under conditions of increased cardiac demand. This compression may result in angina pectoris, myocardial infarction or arrhythmias, contributing to sudden cardiac death in some cases. The histology of coronary artery bridging bridging looks like a segment of a coronary artery that tunnels through the myocardium rather than lying on the epicardial surface. Microscopically, the arterial tunneled segment may show compression of the vessel wall and myocardial fibers surrounding the artery may have potential structural changes. The gross findings of This particular disease is that this artery tunnels through the myocardium instead of running along the heart surface. This tunneling segment may be visible as a groove or depression on the surface of the heart corresponding to the course of the bridged artery. 
upon dissection, compression of the bridge to artery during systole may be observed, with evidence of myocardial fibers overlapping the artery. Next is cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathies can be classified into various types, including dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. These conditions may result from genetic mutations, inflammation, metabolic disorders, or exposure to to toxins. The underlying pathophysiology often involves impaired myocardial contractility, abnormal electrical conduction, and increased susceptibility to arrhythmias and heart failure, ultimately leading to cardiac dysfunction and potential sudden cardiac death. So the histology of cardiomyopathy refers to diseases affecting the heart muscle characterized by structural and functional abnormalities. Histological changes vary depending on the type of cardiomyopathy but may include myocyte, hy hyperthropy, fibrosis, and disarray. For the gro gross findings, um, the gross examination of the heart affected by cardiomyopathy may reveal enlargement or dilation or thickening or also known as hypertrophy of the myocardium, depending on the type of cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy may present with enlarged ventricles and thinning of the myocardial walls, where hypertrophic cardiomyopathy Myopathy may show thickening of the ventricular walls, particularly the interventricular septum. In addition, the myocardium may appear pale or mottled due to fibrosis or fatty infiltration, reflecting structural changes associated with the disease process. We now head on to the respiratory system. First, we have pneumonia. Pneumonia is typically caused by infection with bacteria, viruses, fungi, or other pathogens. Inflammatory response to infection leads to alveolar damage, impaired gas exchange, and accumulation of inflama inflammatory exudate within the lung parenchyma. Severe cases can progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, or septic shock contributing to respiratory failure and death. Histological examination may reveal infiltration of the alveoli and interstitial spaces with inflammatory cells, such as neutrophils and macrophages. Consolidation of lung tissue due to accumulation of exudate, fibrin, and cellular debris may also be observed. For its gross findings, um, the gross examination of the lungs affected by pneumonia may reveal areas of consolidation characterized by firm red or grayish yellow tissue. Consolidated areas may be localized or diffused and are often more pronounced in dependent lung regions. Pleural effusion, necrosis, and abscess formation may also be present in some cases. Next, we have the Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, or COPD. COPD is a progressive lung disease primarily caused by cigarette smoking or exposure to air pollutants. Chronic inflammation in the airways and lung parenchyma leads to narrowing of the airways or chronic bronchitis and destruction of alve alveolar walls, which is also called as emphysema, which results in airflow limitation air trapping, and impaired gas exchange. So histolo histological changes in COPD may include inflammation airway remodeling and destruction of lung. Histological changes in COPD include inflammation airway remodeling and destruction of parenchyma. Chronic bronchitis is characterized by goblet cell hyperplasia, mucous gland hypertrophy, and inflammation of the bronchial walls. Emphysema shows enlargement of air spaces or alveoli with destruction of alveolar walls and loss of elastic recoil.
Gross examination of lungs affected by COPD may show signs of hyperinflation with increased lung volume and decreased tissue elasticity. Emphysematous changes may manifest as bullae or large air spaces or blebs on their lung surface. Chronic bronchitis may present with thickened hyperemic bronchial mucosa and excessive mucus production. Lastly, we have the pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism occurs when blood clots or thrombi or other substances travel to the lungs and block pulmonary arteries, which impairs blood blood flow to the lung tissue. Common sources of emboli include deep vein thrombosis, fat embolism, air embolism, or amniotic fluid embolism. Pulmonary embolism can lead to act acute respiratory distress, right heart strain, and cardiopulmonary collapse. Histological findings of pulmonary embolism depend on the nature of the embolus. Acute pulmonary emboli may show occlusion of pulmonary arteries with thrombi composed of fibrin, platelets, and trapped erythrocytes. Chronic pulmonary emboli may lead to organization of thrombi, vascular remodeling, and fibrosis within the pulmonary vasculature. Gross findings of lungs affected by pulmonary embolism may reveal dilated pulmonary arteries with visible thrombi, particularly in larger vessels. Infarction of lung tissue may be present distal to the site of embolus, characterized by hemorrhagic or pale areas of necrosis. So that is it for the cardiovascular and respiratory system that are related to the natural causes of death. So before we move forward to the other topics, I'd like to just clarify the negative autopsy findings. In cases where autopsy reveals no significant pathological findings or abnormalities in the organs and tissues examined, it is crucial to document these negative findings. Negative autopsy findings suggest that the cause of death may not be readily apparent based on gross or histological examination alone. This can pose challenges in determining the underlying cause and mechanism of death. Negative autopsy findings do not necessarily rule out natural causes of death. They may indicate that the fatal condition was subtle, undetectable at the time of examination or related to systemic factors that are not evident on autopsy such as metabolic disorders or genetic predispositions. Possible explanations for negative autopsy findings include sudden cardiac arrhythmias, metabolic disturbances, neurologic events, or toxicological causes that may not leave detectable structural abnormalities in organs or tissues. It is essential to document negative autopsy findings meticulously in the autopsy report to provide a comprehensive account of the examination findings and ensure transparency in the investigative process. And now for the other diseases, may I call on Ms. Samantha Nicole Barreto to discuss her part. Good morning, everyone. I am Samantha Nicole D. Barreto, and we will now proceed to the discussion on the common causes of death in the nervous system. We will focus on three of the most common diseases, the Alzheimer's disease, ischemic stroke, and aneurysm. These conditions pose serious threats to neurological health and demand attention for their prevention and management. So first is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the accumulation of abnormal protein aggregates within the brain. One of the key pathological hallmarks is the presence of extracellular beta-amyloid deposits, which form neuritic plaques. So these plaques disrupt normal synaptic function and contribute to neuronal dysfunction and eventual cell death. Additionally, intracellular neurofibrillary tangles composed of paired helical filaments primarily consisting of hyperposporylated tau protein, are observed within neurons. 
the formation of these tangles disrupt the structural integrity of neurons and impairs intracellular transport processes, further exacerbating neuronal damage. Upon gross examination, individuals with Alzheimer's disease often exhibit significant cere cerebral atrophy, particularly in regions responsible for memory, cognition, and executive function. The frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes of the brain are commonly affected, reflecting the regional distribution of pathological changes. This atrophy is a consequence of widespread neuronal loss and synaptic dysfunction, leading to a reduction in brain volume and cortical thinning. So shown here is the brain with a pronounced atrophy with Alzheimer's disease seen superiorly and laterally. And so for the histology findings, Microscopic analysis of the brain tissue from AD patients reveals distinct pathological features that underlie the cognitive decline associated with the disease. Neuritic plaques, characterized by the accumulation of beta-amyloid peptides, surrounded by dystrophic neurites and reactive glial cells, are a hallmark pathological finding. These plaques disrupt synaptic transmission and contribute to neuronal toxicity. Additionally, Neurofibrillary tangles, composed of abnormal aggregates of hyperphosphorylated tau protein, are observed within the cytoplasm of neurons. These tangles interfere with the normal cellular function and promote neuronal degeneration. And next is ischemic stroke. The term ischemic stroke is used to describe a variety of conditions in which blood flow to a part or all of the brain is reduced resulting in tissue damage. Although in some cases this may be a chronic condition, most strokes occur acute, acutely. Ischemic stroke occurs when a blood clot or atherosclerotic plaque obstructs a cerebral artery, leading to a reduced or completely blocked blood flow to a specific region of the brain. As a result, the affected area of the brain becomes deprived of oxygen and essential nutrients triggering a cascade of cellular events that culminate in tissue damage in, and infarction. The duration between an ischemic stroke and death significantly impacts the observable gross and histological features during postmortem examination. Within the, 24, within the first 24 hours post-stroke, gross examination may reveal no discernible changes in the affected brain tissue but microscopic examination may uncover cellular edema characterized by the accumulation of fluid within brain cells, leading to swelling and distortion of cellular structures. If that occurs within one week of the ischemic event, gross examination may show edema and the loss of the distinction between gray and white matter junctions in the affected brain tissue, while microscopically, red neurons, necrosis, and neutrophilia may be observed indicating acute neuronal injury in the tissue damage. Between 1 to 4 weeks post-stroke, gross examination may reveal soft, friable tissue in the formation of cysts within the affected brain tissue, while microscopic examination may reveal the presence of macrophages and evidence of liquefactive necrosis indicative of ongoing tissue inflammation and repair processes. Beyond 4 weeks post-stroke, Gross examination may show fibrosis and the presence of fluid-filled cysts with a dark gray margin in the affected brain tissue, while histo histologically, gliosis and the clearance of the crotic tissue by macrophages may be observed, indicating ongoing tissue remodeling and repair in the chronically affected brain tissue. And last for this section is aneurysm. So an aneurysm, characterized by an abnormal swelling or bulge in the wall of a blood vessel, can occur anywhere within the circulatory system, with common sites being the aorta and cerebral blood vessels. Typically, aneurysms greater than 50% of the normal aortic diameter are considered clinically significant. Macroscopically, an unruptured aneurysm presents as a thin-walled, shiny red outpouching often measuring a few millimeters to 3 centimeters in diameter. Rupture frequently occurs at the apex of the sac, leading to potentially life-threatening hemorrhage. Microscopically, the arterial wall adjacent to the neck of the sac exhibits thickening of the intima, 
and thinning of the media as the neck is approached. The sac itself is typically composed of thickened intima with the advantage of the parent artery enveloping the sac. So this histological feature is underscore the structural changes the arterial wall within the arterial wall that contribute to aneurysm formation and progression. And so we will now proceed to the discussion of the gastrointestinal system. Gastrointestinal diseases and illnesses encompasses any ailments linked to the digestive system, including the throat, stomach, and intestines. While gastrointestinal conditions are less common causes of sudden unexpected death compared to other conditions such as cardiovascular diseases, they are equally important in terms of their impact on overall health and well-being. So today we will focus on three common diseases of the GI tract, the liver cirrhosis, celiac disease, and gastroesophageal disease. So cirrhosis, representing a last stage or a late stage of hepatic fibrosis, is characterized by extensive distortion of normal hepatic architecture, so this condition manifests through the presence of regenerative nodules surrounded by dense fibrotic tissue. Upon gross examination, a cirrhotic liver presents visually as nodular and hobnailed on its external surface, with nodularity also evident upon the cut surface. Variations in size, color, shape, and consistent consistency can provide valuable insights into the underlying etiology of cirrhosis. The liver may exhibit induration, shrinkage, and a yellowish tan hue or conversely enlargement and a yellow appearance characteristic of alcohol, al alcoholic fatty cirrhosis or rusty hue as in, in hemochromatosis or a large and green appearance indicative of biliary obstruction. Microscopically, cirrhotic livers display the presence of nodules and fibrous septa resulting in the effacement of the lobular architecture. These nodules are classified into two types, the dissection nodules and the regenerative nodules. Dis dissection nodules contain remnants of portal tracts and central veins and are separated by wide scars, exhibiting thin fibrous septa and dilated sinusoids, particularly at their periphery. In some instances, portal tracts within large nodules may appear hypoplastic lacking bile ducts, creating an impression of a disappearing bile duct disorder. Regenerative nodules arise within scars due to the rich arterial blood supply, presenting as round nodules with a fibrous pseudocapsule and containing bile ductules due to bile flow obstruction. And let us now proceed to celiac disease. Celiac disease is characterized by small intestinal mucosal injury and nutrient malabsorption in Genic genetically susceptible individuals following the dietary ingestion of gluten. The pathogenesis of disease involves interaction between environmental, genetic, and immunologic factors. The disease process unfolds with gluten consumption, initiating an immune response in individuals genetically predisposed to celiac disease. This immune reaction leads to inflammation and damage to the lining of the small intestine, culminating in mucosal injury and compromised nutrient absorption. Upon gross examination, the small bowel and celiac disease may exhibit flattening or blunting of the villi, the finger-like projections crucial for nutrient absorption. In severe cases, ulceration may also be evident, indicative of significant mucosal damage. Microscopic examination of intestinal tissue in celiac disease reveals characteristics, characteristic histological features. Notably, there is an increase in intraepithelial T lymphocytes reflecting the immune activation within the intestinal lining. Additionally, crypt hyperplasia marked by the enlargement and proliferation of intestinal crypts and villus atrophy, the, degener the degeneration and shortening of villi, are observed further impairing nutrient absorption. So for com comparison, the two pictures shows the normal versus flattened mucosa. So this is a normal mucosal appearance of the duodenum, while we can see scalloping and flattening of the duodenal mucosa in the other. 
Next is the GERD or the gastroesophageal reflux disease. It is defined as the presence of symptoms or complications that are directly related to the retrograde flow of gastric contents into the esophagus. A certain degree of reflux is normal. Development of GERD requires either increased esophageal exposure to gastric juice or a reduced threshold for epithelial injury and symptom perception. The pathophysiology Pathophysiology of GERD primarily involves, involves three main factors. First, defective lower esophageal sphincter, or the LES function, contributes significantly to GERD. This function of the LES, a muscular ring that serves as a barrier between the esophagus and stomach, leads to increased reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus. Second, the presence of a hiatal hernia ex exacerbates GERD by weakening the LES and promoting reflux. In a hiatal hernia, a portion of the stomach protrudes through the diaphragm into the chest cavity, further compromising the barrier function of the LES. Lastly, impaired esophageal peristalsis, the coordinated mus muscular con construction that propel, propel food and fluids through the esophagus, esophagus, can hinder the clearance of gastric contents from the esophagus exacerbating reflux symptoms. Microscopic examination of the esophageal tissue and GERD may reveal several characteristic histological features. So these include the presence of inflammatory cells within the squamous epithelium indicating chronic inflammation resulting from exposure to gastric contents. Additionally, elongation of the lamina propria, papillae, and basal cell hyperplasia may be observed reflecting chronic irritation and inflammation of the esophageal mucosa. Let us now proceed to the accuracy and precision, sensitivity and specificity of laboratory tests, and its importance and significance in forensic investigation and laboratory works. Accuracy and precision. Statistical measurements of accuracy and precision reveal a test basic reliability. These terms, which describes sources of variability, are not interchangeable. A test method can be precise without being accurate or vice versa. So accuracy. A test method is said to be accurate when it measures what is supposed to measure. This means that it is able to measure the true amount or concentration of a substance in a sample. So picture a bullseye target with a dart correctly heating the center ring and you see what an accurate test produces. The method is capable of hitting the intended target. While well, precision, a test method is said to be precise when repeated determinations or analysis on the, sam on the same sample give similar results. When a test method is precise, the amount of random variation is small. The test method can be trusted because results are reliably reproduced time after time. So picture a bullseye target with darts all clustered together but not in the center ring. And you see what a precise but inaccurate method produces. The method can be counted on to reach the same target over and over again, but the target may not be the one intended. Although a test that is 100% accurate and 100% precise is the ideal, in reality, this is impossible. Tests, instruments, and laboratory personnel each introduce a small amount of variability this amount of variability does not usually detract from the test value as it is taken into account. Specificity and sensitivity. So, specificity and sensitivity reveal the likelihood of false negatives and false positives. To be effective, a, patholo a, pat a pathology test is expected to detect ab abnormalities with certainty. So, specificity is the ability of a test to correctly exclude individuals who do not have a given disease or disorder. For example, a certain test may have proven to be 90% specific. If 100 healthy individuals are tested with that method, only 90 of those 100 healthy people will be found to be normal or disease-free. The other 10 people also do not have the disease but their test results seem to indicate they do. For that 10%, their abnormal findings are a misleading false positive result. 
the more specific a test is, the fewer false po positive results it produces. A false positive result can lead to misdiagnosis and unnecessary, possibly challenging or life-altering diagnostic procedures and therapies. It is important to confirm a diagnosis that requires dangerous therapy, and a test specificity is one of the crucial indicators. Although few if any tests succeed in diagnosing disease correctly 100% of the time, most tests produce only a small portion of false positive or false negative results. Laboratories are required through laboratory accreditation to use the most sensitive and specific tests available. Sensitivity is the ability of a test to correctly identify people who have a given disease or disorder. For example, a certain test may have proven to be 90% sensitive. That is, if 100 people known to have a certain disease are tested with that method, the test will correctly identify 90 of those 100 cases of disease. The other 10 people who were tested also have, also have the disease, but the test will fail to detect it. For that 10%, the finding of a normal result is a misleading false negative result. A test sensitivity becomes particularly important when you are seeking to exclude a dangerous disease. The more sensitive a test, the fewer false negative results it produces. A false negative result uh, fail to identify disease states even though they are present. And lastly is the importance and significance in forensic investigations and laboratory works. So first is accuracy. So accuracy is essential for obtaining results that are close to the true or accepted values. In forensic investigations, accurate measurements are crucial for drawing correct conclusions and making informed decisions. Accurate laboratory tests ensure that forensic evidence is interpreted correctly and can withstand scrutiny in legal proceedings. Inaccurate results can lead to wrongful convictions or failed investiga investigations, highlighting the importance of accuracy in forensic science and laboratory analysis. Next is precision. So in forensic investigations and laboratory work, precision ensures consistency and reproducibility of results. This is critical for generating reliable data that can be replicated by different analysts or laboratories. Precise measurements help establish confidence in the reliability of forensic evidence, ensuring that conclusions drawn from the data are valid. Precision also helps minimize variability and uncertainty in measurements, reducing the likelihood of errors or discrepancies in forensic analysis. So, specificity is crucial for ensuring that laboratory tests accurately distinguish between similar substances or analytes. In forensic investigations, specificity helps rule out false positive and ensures that identified substances are truly indicative of the presence of a particular compound or material. High specificity reduces the risk of misinterpretation or misidentification of evidence, enhancing the reliability and credibility of forensic analysis. And lastly is sensitivity. So sensitivity is particularly important in forensic investigations for detecting trace amounts of evidence or identifying subtle changes in samples. High sensitivity enables the detection of small quantities of analytes or substances, which may be critical for linking suspects to crime scenes or identifying potential toxins or drugs in biological samples. Forensic tests with high sensitivity increase the likelihood of detecting relevant evidence, enhancing the investigative process and aiding in the resolution of criminal cases. And that is all for our report. Thank you for listening.